Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the Lord of the Rings online casual stroll through Evendim. Happy to uh, to be here again and to, to do a special uh, special stream for you all. Uh, it is Lotro's 14th anniversary this year, so we are very excited to uh, to to do something a little special for you guys. Um, now, those of you that have been on this stream before know that uh, I've been trying to let you all pick uh, where we go next, um, but. Last time, Angmar and e or Forshell and Evendim were just so neck and neck that uh, decided that uh, Evendim deserved its time in the sun. Um, unfortunately, it's it's nighttime right now here on our server, um, so no no sun happening quite yet. But we'll uh, we'll start our trek through Evendim. Um, like I've said before in previous streams, uh, this is going to be a world design focused stream. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about game systems. I'm not going to be talking about uh, things like pricing, release dates, uh, future systems that are going to be coming up. We are talking purely just about the landscape, the world, and talking about uh, Evendim. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's get things started. Um, so even Dim has the distinction of being the first post-launch region added to Lord of the Rings Online. Um, we were really excited to, to come here and to you know, play around in this space. Um, there's so much history in even Dim. Oh, let me get rid of some stuff that I don't really care about. Um, there's so much history and so much lore and so much richness in Evendim that it felt great to tap into. And we were able to take our epic story and tie it into kind of the exploration of uh, the region, the, the home of the Rangers, um, and even add in a little bit of extra Shire uh, to the space with Oat Barton um, and Dwalling. Um, these were fun little like places to kind of return to the Shire to, you know, go back to our roots after you know spending so much time with the game getting more and more dire and more and more dangerous you know coming back in and and doing a space that was you know friendly and happy for the most part um, felt nice um, so after the launch of uh, even dim there was also the uh, the farm that was added up the hill here, which I admit it was it was not something I had uh, had my hand directly in, so I do not know or I do not remember the name of it specifically. Um, but we'll go up and take a quick look at this as well. Um, oh, and we're lagging a little bit on my server. It happens even even to us devs. Um, so going through the stream as we kind of make our way up to get a, a nice view over uh, Oat Barton. It, North Cotton Farm is all up in here. Uh, but you can look out over Oat Barton and you can see you know, a little bits of the uh, the wildwood poking out there in the distance as well. Um, so B414 asks uh, if Oat Barton counts as Evendim or the Shire. Um, well, I think very thematically it counts as the Shire. Um, there may be some deed overlap, I don't recall, um, but by and large, the things that you do here in, uh, in Oat Barton are even dim focused things. You know, the quests count towards your even dim quest journal. Um, as far as access goes, you need to have access to even dim in order to play the content in here. Uh, even though the, the stories that are told here are very much Shire stories. Uh, so Squire asks if North Cotton Farm uh, was planned for release uh, for the release of Evendim. It was not. Um, it was several years down the road. Um, someone wanted to, to do a an instance in the Shire, and it's kind of you know a little tricky to to think about an instance in the Shire. Um, you know what what does it mean to have an instance in the Shire? Um, because the content again is not typically all that dire. Um, so the, the North Cotton Farm ties into the In Their Absence 
uh, storyline, which is focused on like what happens as the the Grey Company, the Rangers, are preparing to march to war um, towards Isengard. You know, they had classically been the the caretakers and guardians of places like the Shire and and Eriador, and in their absence, uh, uh, it's up to the players to kind of fill that role, um, starting with North Cotton Farm. So, um, Soft Snake GR asks, are the Colossuses, are the Colossi statues uh, over the river written in the books, or you made them uh, by some kind of inspiration? Um, I don't recall specifically, actually. Um, I would guess that they're a creation of ours to kind of showcase the uh, majesty of um, old Arnor. So as we proceed down the hill, we come into Dwalling, which is a, another Hobbit village, though this one has been overrun by brigands. Um, there's some great storytelling in here for, for those of you that like kind of deep cut lore. Um, some of the characters here, you know, our friends here, Bob Greenieves, Hob Hillbrow, and Ronald Dwale, um, they, ha they, they are effectively representations of J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and the other Inglings. Um, and, you know, this is kind of our little homage to, to those writers. Um, you know, one of the... There is a Tolkien short story um, about a boy who has a little um, cast metal dog, I believe. Um, and that makes an appearance in this content as well. Um, so, Druidsfire asks, for the matter, why do King's Crossing statues look so different, large brickwork, versus the massive statues elsewhere in games, such as um, Kustan and the statues in Minas Tirith, massive carved works? Um, I think at, I'm going to defer to that as being um, a difference in artists, you know, different artists working on different projects, um, and also as time progresses, um, the standards for certain assets change. Um, the Colossus is certainly one of the largest pieces of architecture up to that point that we had had in game. Like we've had built cities and structures before, but often they were built out of um, several smaller pieces. Um, the Colossi was really kind of represents the first really, really massive single piece of architecture that we've ever built. So I think the artists at the time were kind of Figuring it out, figuring out the balance between um, what they needed to do to make it work and also make it look good and make it be performant. Um, so I, I believe that would account for a good amount of you know why it why it is distinct and why it is different. Um, so we are now on in Barrendolf, the sandy shores along the. Uh, River Brandywine, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to do as we were going into building Evendim was try to make sure that there was very clear biome identities for all the various places that you go through Evendim. Um, you know, we just came through Oak Barton, which had the very heavy Shire influence. Um, you cross up here into Barrendolf, and we have these kinds of, like, sandy, um, duny kind of space. Um, actually very distinct from anywhere else that we had been before. And, and honestly, a little kind of uh, lack of foresight on our part and wanting to do kind of a, a beach-themed space, but not really being sure if we would ever get to the point where we would be able to produce something like that. Um, you progress further up and we have the Twilight Hills um, and then there's the the space in between um, the lake and North Downs in Partha Dweel, which we tried to make be a little bit more spooky. Um,
So one of the like fun little bits of trivia for this space in particular is, um, you know, we have a role on our team um, that is called the world artist. Um, you know, so I'm a world designer. I do dabble into art stuff, but we had a role that was focused on purely the art side of things for world design. Um, they were often the people that were boots on the ground first, making brand new terrain textures, making any sorts of like trees or variants thereof that we needed. Um, so as I was doing a cleanup pass for uh, Even Dim as part of a legendary server update, I was cleaning up some texture usage and I had discovered that our world artist had created a duplicate terrain texture and had signed his name in the sand of Even Dim with this duplicate terrain texture. And I only discovered this because I was playing around with like shifting the colors on the sand a little bit here and there and all of a sudden I saw his name just like pop up right in front of me and I had to, like he hadn't worked on the project in probably at least 10 years, maybe 12 years. Um, and I just, I needed, I like took a screenshot of it, immediately sent it to him and it was like, look what I found. And, and uh, he kind of jokingly says back, oh, that's not the only one. So somewhere else in the, the world, there are other places where he's hidden his name uh, in the terrain of Middle Earth. Oh, also, by the way, again, as of last time, I'm still trying to make sure that I have something to drink. So uh, if it's gone a while and you've noticed I haven't had anything to drink, please remind me to drink so that I don't destroy my voice by the end of this. All right, let's do a quick check through some of the other questions. Uh, Timbo asks, um, or Timbolt asks, uh, or mentions that he does the uh, does the Tolkien toast on Laurelin on January third to go find Ronald and Dwelling. Very cool. Um, uh, Squirrel asks if even them ever got a quest flow makeover. I'm not sure if it ever got a quest flow makeover. I'm, I know that there have been some tweaks and adjustments here and there. Um, but as far as flow goes, I couldn't be certain on that. Um, not, not necessarily my forte. Um, so, uh, soft snake GR at, uh, says in general, compared to the rest of our, the Arnorian ruins and area door, even dim has white stone. Is that meant that, uh, is that meant that Arnorians brought stones from the white mountains, uh, to take up Lake even Um, I mean, I'm sure there is to some degree, uh, a bit of uh, material export and import going on up and down the Brandywine River. Um, you know, not certainly not as grand a river as it probably is intended to be by a um, actual like. If you we were to put this in the real world, I would imagine that the river would be much much bigger. But for game purposes, you know, wider. Uh, but for game purposes, it's it is not. Um, you know, it is it is a more manageable size for gameplay purposes, both so that it fits more reliably and comfortably into our world, but so that um, you know we're not frustrating players if there's content that requires them to cross back and forth uh, multiple times. Let's see. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Do you prefer, so another question uh, from Squirrel, do you prefer to make smaller, clear, defined world or larger spaces? Um, so I really like doing the like big, broad, open spaces um, because I feel like that gives me a lot of room to play around with building an ecology for the space um, and, and helps push things more towards something that feels realistic. I think it's in smaller spaces, it's much easier to build something that is um, very evocative of a specific theme, um, but it's harder to make it feel like it's a, a, a world, um, if that makes sense. Um, you know, you, you, take, you take something like, you know, even dim where, where it is this very like broad open space 
Um, but then you can, but then you look at something like um, one of our festival spaces, like uh, uh, Wistmead um, for the fall festival. Um, you know, Wistmead is very focused on that Halloween aesthetic and can be very, you know, specifically made, but it can also be something that is, you know, can be a little overwhelming in just like how much is packed into that space. These broader, more wider open spaces give you the opportunity to, you know, take a breather, to, to not feel as crowded, not feel as rushed through um, the space as you're playing through it. Um. All right, um, so let's go through a couple more questions while we enjoy this lovely view of Anumanos and the sunrise. Um, I may have to reset the day file a couple of times unless you are all okay with it. Uh, when I checked in earlier, it was uh, raining and storming out in game, much like it's doing outside. Uh, here, um, but uh, so I may reset the day file a couple of times so that we're not dealing with the rainstorm unless, by popular demand, there's a, a desire to see the um, to see the rain. Um, let's catch up on a couple more comments if I can find them because uh, my chat just decided to bounce all over the place on me. Um, so I'm going to skip some of the questions that are here uh, asking about specific NPCs. I couldn't really tell you about um, many of the characters here. There are a few that I, I know um, because I was involved specifically in the design of the spaces that they went in. Um, but for individual story stuff, I've played through them all, but I don't have um, a, a deep background familiarity with a lot of the characters that show up in the game. Um, all right, I think I'm back where I need to be now. Um, so Solkoff asked, did you leave it there or did you remove it uh, regarding the signature in the sand? Um, I did remove it because it was uh, fairly large and a little would be would have been a little challenging to um, actually like clean it up or to to make adjustments so that it could still be there, um, considering that the cleanup that we were doing. Um, Uh, so that kind of stuff. Um, so the question, there was a question about um, the hitching posts in Rohan housing, and if there is a chance that the the mounts that are put on them will be able to move around a little bit. Uh, it's certainly something that we want to do. Um, it's something that we tried to do when we initially launched the system, and it didn't work out quite the way we wanted it to. Um, so we tabled it for the time being. Um, not to say that we're not going to come back to it and try to, to get it to work again. Um, but for right now, they're, they're unfortunately going to be a little, a little static. Um, so now we're coming up on King's Crossing and the Colossus um, of Evendim. He's looking a little shiny here thanks to the new per pixel attenuation stuff. Um, this might be a good asset for us to take a look at as far as, you know, adjusting the normal maps and specularity on it. Um, let's see if I can use this. Oh, I can't use it uh, because I don't have the right quest requirements. So we won't be going up on top of the, uh, on top of the Colossus quite yet today. Um, one of the things that, while I'm here, that I wanted to point out um, was the introduction of the river network. Um, this came, I think, a little bit before Update 29, um, you know, just to kind of ease travel around and as a little bit of a teaser for what we did in Update 29, I added in, there's now a Dockmaster here, there's one down at Trader's Wharf, and then there's one at the, uh, in Buckland. Um, and these can kind of be used to connect up to Tinadir, and then from Tinadir on to the other various docks uh, around Lake Evendon. Uh, Druidsfire asks, are there any screenshots in a dev folder somewhere showing Anuminos without the water 
Uh, I forget offhand whether the city sank into the lake or the lake slowly filled in over time. Um, so we built a Numenos as you see it, um, as this drowned city on the shores of Evendim. Um, I think based off of kind of how the lake, the, you know, the levels of the water that the lake is at and of the Brandywine River, um, at least in terms of how it was built, it makes more sense that it kind of sank in. Um, I am sure that one of our, our lore folk could more specifically say, um, oh, all of this dread, um, could more specifically say um, whether it sank or if the water levels rose. Um, you know, probably in some parts of it, uh, particularly the lower cellars and catacombs of the space is probably more B, water creeping in, than uh, A, uh, them sinking, because, you know, they're below level, but... Um, uh, so, OB in the Ocean mentions that cosmetic pet housing items do move around nicely, and, and that's correct, and it's because it's a uh, different kind of character. Um, you know, the... The cosmetic pets uh, on hooks are still effectively using um, the cosmetic pet uh, background, you know, back end. So they kind of they have the brains to to know how to move around. Um, whereas horses, you know, the the goats, the horses, you know, all the mounts, they're not technically their own independent functioning things. Um, you know, mounts are effectively a visual effect that is applied to a character um, that allows the character to move, to look differently while they're mounted. Um, so they're very, they're very different kinds of um, implementations. So we're making our trip way back over into the North Downs real quick because this was another thing that we were really excited to do with the launch of the game. You know, this gate was up here. Um, this was totally walled off. There was no way in, though I'm sure some people managed to find their way in. Um, but there was no way in here. Um, and with the Evendim update, we broke down the wall, and it was kind of a, uh, an exciting time for new players who had played through the Shadows of Angmar. They had gotten to Angmar. They were familiar with the space, and they were able to see you know, the change in the world um, as they approached in through here. Um, Uh, Iwanar notes, uh, there should be a Dockmaster on Girdley Island too, and I've, I've seen that request come in a few times, and it's something that we could potentially add to our backlog. Um, oh, and I'm being reminded to take a drink. Um... Well, see, we have we have folks in here who are more versed in the nuances of the story than I am. Um, there are a couple of comments talking about how um, the blue lady raised the lake to drown the city. Um, so certainly that sounds like some water level changes uh, helped to see the ruin of a Numenos. Um, so Soft Snake asks, uh, was Evendim always on the agenda to be the first post-launch region? Um, we had a lot of different ideas about where we were wanting to go, way, you know, well before we started building the space. Um, you know, so we had all of these different ideas, but the the way the characters we wanted to involve in the story and the direction we wanted the story to escalate. Even Dim felt like just the right place to go. Um, you know, you had these characters that were on the, their quest for, you know, items of power. You had these, you know, ruins which are perfect for adventuring into. You had this rich lore, um, particularly since we were telling the stories of several of the rangers um, throughout all of this. So even Dim really like when we came to when we had to pick the the spot that we wanted to go to first, uh, even Dim was really kind of a no-brainer. It was a, a level of 
grandness that I think um, it was a level of grandness that I think we were, were hard pressed to ignore. Um, you know, it, it was it was big. It, it gave us the opportunity to build you know a air quotes good major city to kind of counterbalance um, Karndum and all of its dread and darkness. Um, yeah, I think I certainly think some regions that we built are a little bit of a uh, harder sell um, than others uh, when it comes to figuring out how they fit into the storyline. Like I think For Shell, for example, took some gymnastics to uh, make work, but I think even Dim, you know, fit very well in what we were looking to do. Is it still raining? It is still raining. All right. You get to enjoy lovely, lovely daytime. All right. Uh, let's go a little bit to the north. Where do I want to go? Actually, let's go here. Uh, doing a quick check for more questions. Um, so one of the things that uh, fairly, well, I don't know how fairly quickly it changed after the launch of Even Dim, but when, uh, after players had been playing it in a while, there was the complaint of Everswim. You know, we kind of all jokingly love it. Um, and so as part of that, we introduced the Dock Masters um, to around the lake. Um, so they'll bop you around to a variety of different locations that were previously either a very long swim across the lake or a very long uh, run around its perimeter. Um, I think these helped a lot. They kind of broke convention on what we did for travel at the time. You know, we really wanted to make sure that there was a like visual representation of you getting on something um, even if it was to go just for a little bit to teleport we still wanted to have that and but it the feedback that we had had regarding even dim felt like it was uh, important enough for us to kind of break that convention in order to provide um, that functionality so that players wouldn't be as uh, hindered by the size of the lake. Um, so there's a comment about how, you know, since we can't dive into the water uh, in this game, deep water is basically pointless except uh, maybe for appearances. Well, so there, um, the tools that we have for determining what water looks like can take into consideration how far away the terrain is below it, um, which allows it to apply, you know, fog at certain levels. Um, you know, that lets us have either crystal clear water or water that gets murky uh, based on its, on its depth, you know, the closer to shore you get. So there, there may not be a gameplay purpose for having deep water, but it certainly allows us to have some visual purpose uh, for having deeper water. All right, uh, let's do another quick catch up. Um, slow boat travel chances. Uh, were there any plans to make boat traveling? So we'll kind of cover those in there. Um, I think if it was something that we dedicated the, you know, had the time to do and could dedicate the art and engineering resources to it, um, I would think that boat travel is is something that is high on our on our like would be fun to have list um, particularly because we've got the Brandywine River we've got and the Anduin we've got an, a multitude of other you know larger rivers throughout Middle Earth that 
you know, as we fill out the game and as we grow the game, it would be fun to be able to paddle down those rivers or to get on a small boat and take that boat, you know, downstream. Um, it's again, it's a it's a matter of having the time and priority for it. Um, it's not something that is completely off our radar, and it's stuff that actually comes up in conversation every so often uh, amongst all of us. Um, you know, we we like the idea, and we'd love to to have an implementation similar to like what we have for you know our normal traveling mounts, where you can you could get on and you could you know take your boat around the pond if you wanted to. Um, it's just a matter of the time uh, that is needed to actually implement that. Um, so where we're running out right now in the Twisted Grove, this is an example of kind of one of our earliest attempts at building a, you know, out exterior cave space um, using assets for ceilings and whatnot. This was before we had um, our dual height map technology that we introduced with Moria. Um, and the, you know, I think there, there's some degree of success here. Um, you know, certainly this is an older space, so it's not as high detail as um, other spaces might be. Um, I remember playing through this with my burglar and at the time having it be like really challenging because like, wow, everything in here is signature. And it's so hard to, to imagine, you know, fighting more than one or two of them. Um, but looking at looking at that now I, and seeing the power level of characters now, I, you know, laughing at the idea of only being able to fight two signatures. Um, all right, another quick uh, check. Uh, are we getting soft shorelines back in DX 10 and 11 graphics? Um, so uh, Bloodborne asks, so the soft shorelines um, are a feature that we think still exists and certain water types they do exist in still like you can see here this still exists to some degree um, from conversations with our tech art team uh, it just may be that we need you know changes were made and we need to in order to really take advantage of the soft shore lines again um, we need to go back and take a look at some uh, of the water types and see if we can make tweaks and adjustments to them to to kind of reestablish that look and feel. Um, even it was also the first place we saw an ant. Yes, it was outside of uh, fellowship maneuvers, I believe. Um, I think I think that was the f the fellowship maneuvers were you know you can see an ant in the kind of like uh, the red stomp effect, I believe. Um, and the lore master also has. Um, an ent ability, but I believe even Dim was the first place that we saw, we were introduced to an ent NPC. Um, all right, I'm gonna have to get my feet wet. All right. So the uh, rigid shoreline, so uh, IONR notes the uh, rigid shorelines are one of the few flaws of water in the game. I don't recall seeing the other type, but I hope it can be re-implemented. Um, so the rigid shorelines, you know, some, some of that is a byproduct. Like you can see here, you know, it's, it's weird where like it's the same water type, but sometimes there's a hard edge, sometimes there isn't. Um, the rigid shorelines is a combination of... Uh, you know, issues with that soft edge and also um, the fidelity of the landscape. You know, the, the actual terrain mesh of the landscape is, you know, not as as densely verticied as uh, more modern games and engines can provide. Um, you know, I think if, if the... Oh, we're lagging a bit. Um, if the game were to be revamped to the point where you know we could look at doing richer terrain meshes i think we'd all certainly love to do that it might be a little bit too late um at this point in the game to uh, do it for for this game uh, but it's it's something that is like on all of our world building wish lists is if we could ever 
you know, do a richer, denser vertex map for the terrain, we would love it. Um, and that would help so many other things. Like there's, there's a lot of like jagged stuff uh, that can happen um, on the terrain. Um, uh, Mage Centron asks, "What are the possibilities of mounts with a single person carriage with single person carriages behind it, like the kind Gandalf rolled it, wrote in in the films?" Um, I don't have any specific comments on that. Um, we don't have any specific plans for it. Um, but who knows? Like, I don't want to say never on things like that in the future. Um, you know, we certainly have some uh, NPC-based carts that have characters on them that can move around. So it may it may be possible in the future. Again, much like boat, you know, much like boats, if we have the time um, to dedicate to it. But you know, we we like to keep ourselves busy. You know, we've got update thirty. We've got you know, a couple of festivals along the way. We've got Gundabad coming up, you know, so it's it's kind of the question of, like, when do we have time for anything, you know, outside of that? All right, so it looks like uh, I was disconnected from my server. I'm going to try to reconnect to that real quick. Let's see if I can get back on. Um, it's anniversary technical difficulties, all sorts of fun. Yes, I'll use this as an opportunity to drink. Uh, and while we wait for the client to load back up, feel free to hit me with questions, you know, because I'm not going to be driving at the moment, so. Um, so the Kassan Castle was a byproduct of that uh, world artist position. Um, you know, that, that world artist, the same one who wrote his name in the sand, um, he also made the snowman in uh, Arid Lewin. So he, he'd liked to go through and put in, like, little, you know, little, little Easter egg things like that here and there as he was working on a space. Um, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. So Bloodborne responded to Odessia regarding um, what is meant by the soft shorelines. Um, I can come down here real quick to, to elaborate on that. Um, the soft shoreline is basically where the terrain intersects with the water volume. Um, that edge is blended a little bit, so it's just not a hard line. Um, Solkoff asks, was there a specific area in Evendim that you recall being especially difficult to build uh, when you were working on it? Yeah, um, we're actually working our way over there right now. Um, Anuminos is a big, ambitious uh, space that has a lot of stuff going on in it between just the complexity of, of building a channeled city. You know, Anuminos was built very much in the same uh, same vein as much many of our other kind of end game spaces where it was intended to be you know a, a like kind of linear um, open world experience um, where you are trying to work your way through to that camp in Anuminos and when you do then you like that's where you can take a breather um, and then you go out and you try to flip all of the keeps uh, in Anuminos to, you know, give yourself even more breather spaces. And all of this is just as a, you know, means to an end to actually get to the instance spaces in Anuminos. So there's a lot of compl complexity going on here and a lot of, you know, kind of precursor work to the kinds of things that you see us doing, you know, in terms of complexity in like Minas Tirith and Mordor and Gondor in general, um, even in, um, you know, Elder Slade and uh, the White Mountains and Yarnfast, like just Anuminos was us was the space that kind of showed us that we could do cities um you know that that you know i think breland was at that point kind of our biggest most dense city um 
but a Numinos kind of tried to take it one step further and make it a gameplay space more so than a social space. Um, uh, let's see, was there something like chicken session play? When something like chicken session play adds elements um, to existing regions, do they consult with the original designer of the region or is a standalone effort? That kind of thing is usually a standalone effort. Um, you know, stuff like chicken play does not typically interact with or intersect with the um, too much with the you know normal landscape play. So there's not really much of a need for you know a big confab of you know let's you know we want to do chicken play here and we want to be able to get chicken the chickens to go here. We don't really need to involve everyone in that conversation. There might be. Um, someone on the world team that is tapped just for ideas about places to you know, look to. Um, but otherwise, it's not something that um, really needs a, a, a lot of buy-off on. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. So a Numinos, yeah, so there, there has been, you know, kind of these dreams that a lot of us have had in our head of like, okay, so we've, you know, we've kind of broken the seal on these back in time regions. Um, there, there are so many like fun ruins to see, you know, how things could look or could have looked in their pristine versions. Um, you know, not, not even just here in Anumanos, but you go to a Regan and you go into, you know, uh, I mean, even going back, going into Elder Slade and going into um, the White Mountains, like there just be there are a lot of cool ruins that it would be fun to see what they you know ultimately originally looked like. Um, and I think from a storytelling perspective, we're we're not afraid to go back and tell those stories. Um, not to say that we were afraid to go back and tell those kinds of stories before, um, but I think it's something that you know we've we experimented with in Mordor Besieged and the concept of it was was well re well received and um, you know it's it's something that we we think there's there's you know good info and good lore to mine out of doing those kinds of things um, So one of the one comment in there about uh, having a Numinos become kind of a hip bolt style uh, rebuild when uh, Aragorn comes back to to rebuild the city um, certainly would be a very large and ambitious hip bolt um, considering how how big this city is um, you know the tricky thing with hip bolt too is it can do we can do a lot of visual changes with our phasing technology. Um, but Hitbolt doesn't allow us to do physical changes. Um, so we can't do um, changes to the physical space, like what you would be able to collide with, like these walls here, um, using the Hitbolt tech, you know, because we have to maintain that physical shape for every player, regardless of what, what phase they're in. If we were to ever to get, you know, physics-based phasing, then I think that opens up a lot more flexibility for us to to do things like hip bolt in a you know an even more meaningful way. Um, uh, let's see. So lots of future questions that I'm seeing. You know things about um, you know the. The future of certain areas, such as the future of Trestlebridge rebuild, future of Shire and the scouring of the Shire, and those are all things that are just going to have to be kind of you know wait and see. Um, are there any particular locations that you have worked on that still not you that you just can't fix? Um, I think it depends on what you mean by um, just can't fix. Um, certainly, like 
I look back at some of the old artwork that I created back before I became a world designer for the project and kind of cringe whenever I see someone using it. Um, I think about um, some of the instant spaces, especially running through them and seeing how low detail um, they are uh, and kind of being like, I wish I had the time to, to go back and um, clean those up, you know, add some more detail, do lighting better, basically take all of the lessons that I've learned um, over the years and, and apply them to old spaces. But then you, you, I have to stop and think like, you know, how, how much value does doing something like that actually add? Um, and if it's just a one-off thing, it's hard to, it's hard to, to really justify that sometimes. Um, I think Legendary Worlds were a great opportunity for us to do some of that kind of light touch, go through, clean up, and polish. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that we took that opportunity because I think some, some areas really did need a texture rehab or really did need just kind of that little fresh coat of paint on them um, in order to, to feel a bit more modern. Um, you know, I think the newer regions in the game need that less um and i think that's a that's a good thing and it shows that we've been able to like grow and advance what we do uh in world design um and have learned a lot of lessons over time um there is no lore for the Illuminos layout is there tolkien said it was on lake evenim and that gives nothing about how it was actually constructed so you were free to design as you liked. Um, to some extent, I think we found some source images that that had a general sense of um, the shape of the city. Um, you know, we know that there are major certain major landmarks um, that are called out in the lore um, that we, you know, made sure to account for. Um, there are there's a lot of lore talking about. The things that are in the area, but not necessarily specifics of the the shapes they are, the kinds of layouts they might have, um, and that's where where our coming in and um, adjusting, you know, coming in and doing our design work comes into play. You know, we can we can kind of take the inspiration from the bits that we have in the lore and go from there. Um, the instance cluster in uh, Anuminos is kind of an example of some of that where. You know, we go in and, you know, we had some ideas for things that as we were building the city felt like would make for interesting spaces. That's why we have the, you know, we have the gardens, we have the palace, we have the tombs. You know, those those instant spaces are meant to kind of evoke, you know, aspects of the look and feel of the Numenos um, and kind of push those, push in those themes a little bit more directly. Um, let's go down through some more questions. Um, so I can't talk about anything regarding the, uh, the Amazon MMO. Um, you know, it's, I think, you know, games come and games go and, you know, we'll just, we'll, and meanwhile, we'll keep on making Lotro, you know? Um, lots of love for the sunken city firmly fixed my, in my mind how Anuminos is even though I don't think it's the that way in the book explicitly um, again like I think there's there are a lot of uh, details that we filled in um, certainly we needed more details on certain things in order to actually build something that was a city um, oh and he nails the jump uh, how much water does the lake contain? Uh, it contains a lot of water. I could not begin to try to um, calculate that for you. Um, I wish I could remove all the southern part of the cliffs that surround Wildermore and Rohan. Um, so that is something that is maybe it is a is something that 
again is another one of those if we ever had time for it and if we ever decided we wanted to do something similar to what we did with uh, the wildwood you know that section between you know the great river and lothorian and wildemore wouldn't wouldn't be the worst to kind of dig in and um and do something additional there as well um making no promises about when or even if that would happen but just saying you know hypothetically like that's a that's a decent piece of real estate to to look into um to do that kind of thing uh what location that hasn't been released uh whether plans exist or not would you most want to work on um so I've, i know i've mentioned it a few times before one of the things that kind of I, I feel the saddest about um, in all of Lord of the Rings is the fact that Aaron Lewin is kind of off on its own in its own little its own little pocket. Um, and if I ever had the opportunity to um, connect those two, whether that's through introducing the Tower Hills or introducing you know additional portions of the Shire and foothills of uh, the Blue Mountains. Um, I would I would love to be able to do that. Um, I think it's it's something that you know saying saying Lord of the Rings is an open world game is great, but then we have this little like pocket of land that's just kind of off on its own that I wish we could you know bring into bring into the fold and make it contiguous with everything else. Um, other than that, like I'd love to to play around in the Swan Fleet. Um, you know, I really really enjoyed working on Oregon and I I'd love to do more similar kinds of environments. I think, you know, the the landscape we intentionally built it to suggest a a broader land beyond the boundaries of Oregon and I'd love to just fill that in. I mean in general I'd love to, there's there are so many little like pockets of landscape that um are just asking for you know the walls to be torn down and for for fun little pieces of content to put in and I think the 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 overall like positive response to things like the wildwood means that there might be you know more opportunities for us to do those kinds of things in the future if you know if that's the kind of thing that you guys like and that's the kind of thing that you want. Um, Uh, let's see. Um, so a couple of people commenting too about, you know, Ionar even mentioned like even a small region with no quest would be fine. Um, I think there is some challenge in doing uh, small regions with no quests because it's harder to gauge the success of that kind of area. If there's nothing to do in it, it's hard to know the number of people that really appreciate it. So I feel like we can certainly do areas that have a little bit of a, a lighter content burden on them, a lighter content load on them. But I, th I think that anything we introduce as far as landscape goes, there still has to be a little bit of something in it. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be, you know, competitive with a quest pack, you know, like something like Elder, you know, Elder Slade. It's probably a bad example, but something the size of Elder Slade or Grey Mountains or... Walls of Lang Flood, Bales. it doesn't have to be that size, but there should still be a little something uh, in any piece of land that we, we open up and make available. Um, so that the, there's incentive for people even beyond the explorers to, to go out and participate in it. Um, all right, so I think that's about it for Evendim. We've run through everything. We've gone north and south. We've gone through Anuminas. We've taken a look at, you know, your questions. And, you know, I, I feel like as part of, uh, as part of the anniversary, there's a little something that we wanted to show you guys. Uh, a little bit of a sneak preview. Because we're no longer doing a casual stroll through Even Dim. We are doing a casual stroll through as a new bazaar. So 
So welcome everyone to As New Bazaar. We're not going to do a very in-depth uh, run through of this because we still want to give you guys some surprises. Um, but I did want to introduce As New Bazaar to everyone. This is our update 30 piece of landscape. Um, you know, I was perhaps foreshadowing a little bit when I had mentioned back in time areas, and I'm sure some of you um, are already aware that this is where we're going. But As New Bazaar is the land that will become the Dimrel Dale. Um, this is the site of one of the last great battles between the orcs and dwarves. Um, and what we can see here is all of, and I mean all of, the dwarf clans amassing for a final battle against Azog. Um, so update 30, we're calling it the Blood of Azog. It takes place here in Azinul Bazaar. Um, this map may look familiar. Um, you may be able to see parts of the Dimrel Dale and in this. And you know the core section of it is the Dimrel Dale. Um, but we've expanded um, on it to give a little bit more playable space. Dimrel Dale was a fairly narrow region, um, you know, connecting Moria to Lothorian. Um, and we wanted to add a little bit more so that it was, you know, fuller and um, a meatier content experience. So you will be able to experience the the war of dwarves and orcs uh, in Azanul Bazaar for update 30. Um, and in addition to this kind of new experience this new kind of tale of yore um, we have also brought some of the landscape additions that we've added for um, this version of the Dimrel Dale back into um, Dimrel Dale proper in update 30. So in addition to uh, in addition to this landscape space there's going to be some new landscape added to uh, the Dimrel Dale as well. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll run up the hill a little bit because there's one thing to see, one thing to show off as we climb our way up the Dimrel Dale. Um, do not want to show or spoil too, too much. You can see off in the distance, you know, these mountains up here are accessible. The mountains to the left are accessible. You know, so it's it's a bit of familiarness, familiarity. Um, you know, a Durin stone that looks better than you know what you're used to seeing. Orcs that are punching me as I'm running around. This is a, a bit different from uh, previous uh, casual strolls. Things are actually attacking me here because it is a, a level one thirty zone. Um, So this is all in progress currently, um, so nothing, visuals are not final yet. You'll notice some things popping in and out, some things may not be rendering up too well. But this may be familiar to those of you who have played through the content. We have a newly revamped uh, asset for the gates into Moria as part of this update as well. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you everyone, and I hope that uh, 
you enjoyed this casual stroll through Evendim with a side stroll into Azanul Bazaar. Uh, everyone, please enjoy the anniversary. Thank you so much for coming here and asking me your questions. Um, I hope again to be doing these regularly um, and we'll get back to the regular schedule of letting you all pick where we go to visit. Um, so thank you. Uh, please log in, get your anniversary gifts and enjoy the anniversary events and, uh, and have a good week.